I work in addiction medicine and own my own clinic, using neuromodulation and electrical auricular therapy to help people get off opiates with minimal withdrawals. Spirituality is an important part of addiction medicine, but I do not try to push anyone towards any specific path and let them leave their own way. I know that addiction is associated with entity attachment and that you have to separate yourself from the entity as well as the addiction. I'm also aware that this is carried through familial lines and has a lot to do with your environment. With so many people facing this problem, how can I use magic and knowledge and ritual in the occult in my practice to increase willpower, health, and cravings to guide others and banish this from the mind of those affected so that they can truly heal. In the United States it's not just opiates there are so many people on antidepressants and other psychotropic medications from the doctor that I feel is making this reality unrecognizable. Oh yes, you are so right. It's a long question, colleagues, but probably a very important one especially if someone close to you or just around you has got into this trouble, because it is a really serious trouble. But we don't look at our research questions from a psychological or sociological perspective, we look at them from a magical perspective. So let's try to look at this question from a magical perspective as well. Addiction, drug addiction, substance addiction and everything related to it, is a real problem. And the problem is not only that this phenomenon is present in our lives, the problem is not only that some government systems sometimes tolerate and even encourage drug use, but that for many people there is an intense need to use substances. And it is this need that will be the subject of our discussion today. When does addiction occur, or more precisely, when does a person feel the need to take an addictive substance at least once? The point is that in order to understand how we can help people with this problem, we need to understand the mechanics of the process. When a person takes a drug, he is trying to compensate within himself, mainly within his consciousness, for a lack of something, or perhaps he is trying to get rid of an excess of something. But it is rarely the case that a person is trying to compensate for an excess. Rather, he is trying to compensate for a lack of something. He experiences certain emotions, but he can't turn them into something more constructive than just emotional feelings. He experiences certain feelings or, on the contrary, the total absence of feelings, and he thinks that with the help of these substances he will be able to fix all this, which actually turns out to be true for a short time, but he forms what is called an addiction. And as a result his consciousness is no longer willing to compensate for the excess or lack of emotion in any other way, because to create new neural connections he has to spend time and energy, he has to draw on experience, he has to work on compensating for the lack of emotion, and he has to work on eliminating the destructive excess of emotion. But human consciousness is biological in nature, it is biochemical in nature. And man acts as a biological being. He follows the path of least resistance. If he knows that there is a way to solve his problem quickly, he will try to solve it that way. And once a neural pathway to the source of pleasure is created in a particular area of consciousness, it will constantly urge a person to direct his energy in that direction. But that energy will be of a special kind. Because when a person is under the influence of drugs, 
His consciousness is filled with illusions. It is filled with something that is not real. During drug intoxication, the consciousness opens up to absorb missing experiences or to extract them from the surrounding world. At that moment there is a high probability that some energetic entity will enter the consciousness because it is open and completely unprotected. Moreover, the consciousness itself attracts and invites something that will help a person to experience emotional states that he cannot experience in a normal sober state. And so such an energo-informational structure gains access to consciousness. This structure is essentially a program, and the stronger this program is, the more intelligent it is, the more complex it is, the more difficult it is to remove. That's how what is called the lodging of an entity happens during drug intoxication. Alcohol intoxication works in exactly the same way, it's just that alcohol, unlike drugs, has a slightly different effect on the physical body. And it's easier to remove a lodged entity from an alcoholic than from a drug addict. This can be explained from a biological point of view, but as a colleague who works professionally with the problem of drug addiction knows from her own experience, it's not just a matter of neurophysiology, there is something else, something magical, and neurophysiology can only offer a conventionally accepted explanation for this phenomenon. And how can magic help solve this problem? Well, we can turn to the experience of those people who have faced similar problems and been able to overcome them. There is a magical practice first described by Sumerian magicians that is many, many thousands of years old. And there is a book by Charles Fossey, if I remember correctly. It is called Assyrian Magic. It contains very artistic, but nevertheless very precise descriptions of all these procedures. By which magicians and sorcerers helped a sick person to get rid of the disease. And at that time people believed that all disease was caused by something lodged, something non-human, something harmful that had been introduced into the human consciousness. So they had rituals, a sequence of steps to remove it. By the way, this practice and sequence of steps still exists today, and as a matter of fact all practitioners, mages, sorcerers and healers still use it as an algorithm. According to this algorithm, you must find the location of the evil entity, extract it, transfer it to another carrier, magically attach it to that carrier, and place a seal on it, just as King Solomon used the seal to command well-known demons in a brass vessel. But most importantly, once this entity has been removed from the patient, the space that it has occupied should not be left empty. It should be filled with something more positive, like a positive entity that is not harmful, that does not feed at the expense of a person, but on the contrary begins to nourish a person and put him in harmony. Such entities were believed to be the spirits of nature, the spirits of plants, the spirits of trees. 
A person became related to a particular source of power in the form of a totem tree, a totem animal, or some other source of personal power, such as a household god. And so a person received protection from a more positive force. In other words, he received an entity attachment, but that entity was not negative. It was positive. And while a negative entity was destroying his consciousness, causing him to lose energy, or experiencing destructive emotions all the time, a positive entity was giving him energy in bringing his consciousness into harmony but of course under certain conditions. A person took some vows or made some sacrifices, or a priest imposed certain obligations on him. In any case, it was ritualized according to the religion and cult in which that person existed. And the Sumerians described this whole process quite well, they had a great experience of this kind of healing. If we apply what has been said to our time, to the realities of today, we will see that in principle the difference is not very significant. We also need to find the location of the harmful entity. Magically close it, extract it, seal it, which means we need to repeat the same sequence of steps but in a slightly different way, using methods available to the modern person. For example, mages who study runes in general can easily use runes for this purpose. There are special formulas for extracting, transferring, sealing the negative entities and further filling the consciousness with the positive ones, all this can be found, the modern mages who have an aptitude for science, usually deal with psychotherapy. For example, the same Gestalt therapy, which is of course far from perfect, aims to achieve practically the same result. A person verbalizes his problem and then paints over it, seals it, burns it, well, performs some kind of ritual action to put an end to it. It's just that Gestalt therapists forget that the empty space in consciousness cannot be left empty, that it has to be filled with something, because nature abhors a vacuum. And after a piece of consciousness has been torn out, the consciousness may remain empty for half an hour or so, but then it will inevitably fill itself with something. And most likely it will not be the most positive thing, because human nature tends towards evil. And a man will hardly remember the good things that happened in his life, he will rather remember and extract from his subconscious something terrible, something that actually has every chance of becoming the same evil entity as that which was extracted from him. So you have to approach this issue comprehensively. You have to approach it correctly. You should never forget that when you take something out of consciousness, you have to fill the empty space appropriately, and it should bring healing rather than harm. Now to the causes of this phenomenon. You know, if I were to tell you that the current situation, namely the provocation by opiates, is a form of natural selection, I don't think that would be enough. But this definition is probably the most accurate when we talk about the causes. It is a game of elimination, the elimination of the weakest, because the temptation to solve problems quickly, in a second, is always greater than the path of working on oneself. The path of personal inner alchemical work is never easy. There is an algorithm for such alchemical work, but the one who understands this algorithm must have a great will to use it. But colleague Ashley, how much will your patient's personal will be awakened if you tell him that everything that has happened to him is a provocation of the system? And if you told him that, how long would you be able to keep your job? And this is already a question of struggle with society, because the social world is false to the core, 
до основы. И за рождественскими гимнами скрывает Because behind its Christmas carols, in words of Christian love, salvation, and forgiveness, it hides the pleasure of seeing others taken out of the social game one by one. It hides the pleasure of seeing others dropped out of the competition for social success, and the hypocrisy of such a society, to our great regret, is not something that can be cured by magic. So choose your own battlefield, consolidate your positions and continue your work, bearing in mind that you won't be able to save everyone. But perhaps, if you start to look at this problem properly, you will find an algorithm of steps that will be successful in your particular activity. And so I wish you success in your hard work colleague.